In recent news, there has been a focus on creative industries being affected by their intersection with capitalism. After doing some light reading, I've put together an explanation for why this is, and why it will not stop anytime soon. Today, I will be explaining why creators and artists are inhibited due to economic pressures and a lack of resources, and what currently exists to help reduce that. Full disclosure, I will be taking a very American-centric view of the situation. If you don't have time to watch the video, or you just want a quick summary, Capitalism Cuckolds Creativity. In art classes, I was sold on this image of famous, talented artists being regular people. The only thing that distinguished them from anyone else at the time was their passion for creation. They weren't born with the innate gift of artistry, they had to work at it. Artists like Leonardo da Vinci and Van Gogh were renowned for their own hard work and were self-made men. Having done some minimal research, I can say that the Arizona education system sucks even more than I originally thought. Leonardo da Vinci came from a long line of notaries. His own father was a notary for many of the city's monasteries and religious orders, the town's Jewish community, and on at least one occasion, the Medici family, with the Medicis being a bourgeois family that ruled over Florence and Tuscany for almost 300 years. On top of being able to provide monetary support, Leonardo's father was able to secure an apprenticeship for his son with a past client. This client ran one of the best workshops in Florence. Vasily Kandinsky, a pioneer in abstract art, was born in 1866, and his father earned his living in the tea business at a time when tea was an extremely lucrative venture. Paul Cezanne helped develop the transition of art from the 19th to the 20th century, and was the son of a well-to-do bourgeois family. His father was a banker, and at one point had Paul enrolled in law school. Vincent van Gogh, known only for his missing ear, did have a more modest upbringing. His father was a clergyman, and stood at the apex of Zundert's tiny elite. His father earned only a modest salary, but had a house, a maid, two cooks, a gardener, a carriage, and a horse provided by the church. His mother learned to draw and paint with watercolor, pastimes that had been taken up by the new bourgeois class, and taught Vincent as well. Picasso's parents came from minor aristocratic families, and his father was an artist, a teacher, and a curator for a museum. Now, in no way am I saying that these men are undeserving of the praise for their artistic ability. Regardless of the circumstances they were born into, they were influential in their artistic creations. Truthfully, there are a number of artists who were born into middle or lower class families with just as successful careers. However, it's important to note that these specific artists had distinct advantages over others, which cannot be ignored. In contrast, a large number of Americans do not have access to these sorts of resources. Let's take a look at some of the employment data from the U.S. Department of Labor. The Department of Labor tracks all the different jobs in the U.S., the number of people with those jobs, the hourly and annual wage averages and medians, among many, many other numbers I won't be covering. To save you from listing these numbers for every single job, I've compiled them into a single Excel file and created a fancy graphic. In 2017, the U.S. Census Bureau estimated the total U.S. population as 325,147,121 people. Combining these pieces of information, we find that just under 8% of the population falls within these job categories, meaning that there are over 26 million Americans who are in a job that has a medium annual wage of under $30,000. That's not a surprising number by any means, given how some of these jobs are heralded as being for high school and college age students, and thus not a real job. Yet, a number of these jobs are things that students couldn't or shouldn't do. Laborers, elderly, and home health aides, nursing and teaching assistants are all real jobs, but still get paid so very little, and make up a good portion of the working population. In addition, the annual wages listed are for full-time positions, which few students are able to achieve. Meaning, we have just about 8% of the working population who spend 40 hours a week at their jobs, and they're barely making anything. With wages like that, it would be difficult to have extra money to explore creative avenues that more affluent workers could. In addition, we have to think about the time commitment. Even if these people had enough savings to invest in taking art classes or buying supplies, 40 hours a week takes up a large chunk of your time, and likely interferes with any class they could take. Add in life responsibilities such as keeping a clean house, preparing food and other maintenance, and that little free time dries up. On top of that, many of these jobs are physically strenuous, requiring the employees to run around for hours at a time, constantly on their feet. All that together paints a picture that, for 8% of the population, there's little reason to expect that any art they do create is at its full potential. Now, if we stop there, that would be acceptable. 8% of the population, while still a large amount of people, is an acceptable number, given the pure difficulty in giving everyone an equal opportunity. Yet, you might be noticing, I've only listed out 14 jobs. 
there are many, many more jobs that pay equally terrible wages. If I wanted to paint capitalism as a true horrorscape, I would have continued to list out all the different jobs until I'm down to those with only a few hundred people. But I stopped. Because even if I continued, that 8% isn't the full story. The Census Bureau released two reports on poverty in September of 2018, one titled Income and Poverty in the United States, 2017, and the other The Supplemental Poverty Measure, 2017. In the first report, it stated that for those who worked full-time, year-round, 2.2% were in poverty in 2017. So of that working population, 2.2% are all but completely cut off from opportunities to create art. Not only do they not have time, they don't have the funds to even think about purchasing materials more expensive than a dollar store box of crayons. But that's not all. In the U.S., 12.4% are below the poverty line. According to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the maximum annual income to be below the poverty line is $12,490 for an individual and $25,750 for a four-person family. However, the cutoff point for poverty is contentious. There are a number of mitigating factors not taken into account, such as work and medical expenses, cost of living differences based on location, as well as government benefits such as SNAP or government housing. For this reason, the Supplemental Poverty Measure, or SPM, was developed. The SPM report reveals that when other factors are taken into account, there are actually 13.9% of Americans who are in poverty. We also have to take those who are near poverty into account. Now let's define near poverty as making up to 1.49 times the cutoff point for their family size, meaning that an individual making $18,610 per year, or 1.49 times 12,490, counts as being near poverty. When we take that into account, we see that 21.1% of Americans are in or near poverty according to the Department of Health and Human Services, and 29.4% are in or near poverty according to the SPM. That means that between 68 and 195 million American citizens are in or near poverty. Effectively, 195 million Americans are totally cut off from making arts. When families are scraping by, barely making ends meet, living paycheck to paycheck, and still don't have enough, that's no way to live. That's no way to create, to express yourself, to even relax after you get home from work. I could talk more about how these numbers are tragic especially when you take into consideration just how much money some people make in a week that others won't see in a lifetime. That's a topic for another time, though. Let's pretend that we only care about the 7 out of 10 Americans who aren't in poverty. We'll say that these people make enough to have discretionary income and that they work a comfortable enough job that they have energy when they get home. Under capitalism, any time, energy, or money spent that doesn't increase your wealth is wasted. Because of this, there is a cultural emphasis on making money from your hobbies, which cannot be ignored. Look towards Etsy, where there are so many people who are trying to sell their crafts, even if their profit is minimal, just because they're trying to make some money off of it. Or think about the number of artists who do commission pieces, or otherwise sell their works to a wide audience. Now, let's put a pin on that for a minute, and talk about Andy Warhol. In another example of the Arizona education system failing, I was under the impression that Andy Warhol's works were a critique of consumerism. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Warhol celebrated consumerism, or at the very least, leaned into it in order to make money. In his words, making money is art, and working is art, and good business is the best art. Good business is to make as much money as possible from as many people as possible. If good business is the best art, then your art has to appeal to as wide an audience as possible. Because of this, your art must be easy to consume, or at least be appealing. Look towards Duchamp's Fountain for an example of the antithesis of this. Fountain was a urinal set on its back and sent to an art exhibition to be displayed under the pseudonym R. Mutt. The piece was never displayed as it wasn't deemed to be decent enough and would have turned people away from the exhibition. Now, Fountain might have been Duchamp's attempt to see if this exhibition would be tolerant of new ideas on art. In the past, Duchamp had a painting, titled New Descending a Staircase Number 2, that he had to withdraw from another exhibition after backlash, due to it being indecent. Now, if a piece in an exhibition was turned away despite not being for sale, what about artists who do have to sell their works? If an artist has to rely on their crafts to make money, they inherently have to change it in order to be more palatable. Think of all the fan art and t-shirts that are pandering towards gamer or nerd culture. A number of them, of course, are made because someone felt inspired by the source material and wanted to share that creativity. But how many of them exist so that someone could make a few dollars, or to help pay rent? 
While societal pressures are going to exist regardless, economic pressures have an undeniable effect on what art is being made, and why. Even Leonardo da Vinci experienced these pressures. For the workshop he was an apprentice at, the goal was to produce a constant flow of marketable art and artifacts, rather than nurture creative geniuses yearning to find outlets for their originality. There's no better modern example of this than in the video game industry. Video games are unarguably an art form, if not because of the creative efforts behind the works, then because Warhol would consider them good business. I'm going to focus on some of the larger gaming companies, as they are a perfect example of the end result of the intersection of capitalism and art. It's no secret that the larger game publishers exist solely to make money. Look towards Konami, who has cut Hideo Kojima from their ranks, likely in part due to how expensive it is to create his games and the poor return on investment. Or another video game giant, Konami, who is currently producing mobile games and gambling machines based off of their popular IPs. Valve, who used to create video games and now just caters a storefront with the side hustle of gambling in nearly all of their games. Bethesda, who releases subpar buggy experiences because they know their community will fix the bugs for free. Bethesda, who released Fallout 76 and gave me confidence that I might be an okay programmer after all. Or even the game Apex Legends, an offshoot of the Titanfall series, likely developed in part due to historically poor sales for the developer. Perhaps most damning of all is Activision Blizzard. Recently, they laid off 800 jobs despite a record-setting revenue for 2018. However, the revenue increase was not as much as they wanted, and the next year didn't look any better, meaning they had to trim some fat. Think for a moment about how that affects developers' work. If I knew that any slip-up, any sales dip that was out of my control could lead to me not having a job, I wouldn't be doing my best work. I would be scared, anxious that any day now I would be out of a job. Even outside of making a good creative work, I wouldn't be making a good product in general. But why do they need to lay off anyone at all? Why has there been this great shift in their games towards microtransactions? The answer, of course, is money. Let's look towards the 2017 financial report that was released by Activision Blizzard. I'm using the 2017 report as they haven't posted their 2018 report, but the information is still relevant. Under the section Recurring Revenue, Business Models, and Seasonality, there is a particularly fun paragraph. While our business is transitioning to a year-round engagement model, the interactive entertainment industry remains somewhat seasonal. We have historically experienced our highest sales volume, particularly for Activision, in the year-end holiday buying season, which occurs in the fourth quarter. Following the acquisition of King, which focuses on free-to-play games, which are generally less seasonal, and as we otherwise make the shift to a year-round model, less of our revenues are generated during the fourth quarter. For our reportable segments, Activision, Blizzard, and King, the percentage of our revenue represented by the fourth quarter in each of 2017 and 2016 was 36%, as compared to 46% in 2015. Although I don't have a business degree, I can do math and even occasionally think. Let's take a closer look at quarter four's drop from 46% of net revenue to 36%. While at first glance that might seem like a negative thing, it's quite the opposite. With 46% of net revenue being generated in quarter four, Activision Blizzard has to rely on a small time frame in order to keep their business on the up and up. If they suffer a bad quarter four or even just a below average one, they're looking at a hefty drop in money. On top of that, they won't be able to make up that difference for another year. Pulling from the report again, the revenue for 2015 was $4.6 billion, 2016 was $6.6 billion, and 2017 was $7 billion. With their acquisition of King in 2016, Activision Blizzard not only had a nearly $2 billion increase in net revenue, but they also assured a more steady year-round stream of money. In the introductory letter from Bobby Kotick, the CEO and President, and Brian Kelly, the chairman of the board, they had the following to say. In 2017, we generated nearly $4 billion of our nearly $7 billion of net bookings from digital in-game content. That includes things like Overwatch loot boxes, mobile game transactions, and so on. Now, if I were an investor, I would be fully behind expanding that number even further. I don't care about the quality of games or whether or not they help expand the gaming medium in a meaningful way. I want my $0.34 cents dividend per share to go up, and I want the stock value to go up. I don't care about games, I care about my return on investment. I want to see an ever-growing revenue, because that means I get to make more money off of my money. In order to keep that revenue on the up and up, Bobby Kotick had to lay off nearly 800 people, because the billions they already made weren't enough. In the face of all this, it's easy to think that true art is an untouchable dream, 
If in America, the land of the free and the home of the Big Mac, we are unable to afford everyone the opportunity to create, then where else could capitalism allow it? Let us look past the analog and move towards the digital, the internet. Although it's not a perfect solution by any means, the information age has afforded so many an opportunity to learn and create. There are so many websites that help decentralize knowledge, previously allowed to only those with deep enough pockets. If you can think of a hobby or craft, there is a website that caters to that specific demographic. Almost every time, the content on that website is made by hobbyists who love what they do and want to share what they know with whoever is interested. Look towards websites like Instructables, where for the low price of free, you're able to enroll in classes. You get an instructor teaching you, at your own pace, how to create. If you're not able to find what you need there, look no further than the website you're on right now. There are so many instructional videos being uploaded every day, all of them for free. However, the people willing to teach you through videos aren't paid a meager wage by your tax dollars. Much like real teachers, they have to pay for their own supplies and are only provided the space that they work in. In the face of this, it's hard to imagine why they would continue to create, especially given YouTube ad payment changes. According to Polygon, YouTube's new rules state that creators must now accrue 4,000 hours of watch time over the course of 12 months and reach 1,000 subscribers to qualify for monetization. For some people, the videos they create don't have a wide enough audience to reach those sorts of numbers, or they don't release videos often enough. In addition, it demoralizes creators to work on something that they believe has value, and be told through policy that no, it doesn't. Patreon exists to help fill that revenue gap. Patreon, if you aren't familiar, is a service that allows content creators to collect monthly donations from fans. Currently, content creators get 90% of the monthly income, with the other 10% going towards transaction fees and Patreon's cuts. Patreon has more than 3 million patrons, and is projected to pay out $500 million in 2019. Graftreon, a website dedicated to tracking Patreon patron stats, goes into further detail. As of this writing, there are 5 million pledges, meaning some patrons support multiple creators, and over $12 million donated every month minus any hidden donations. If you watch someone on YouTube, it's very likely that they have a Patreon, even if they have a larger following. Most video creators rely on Patreon so they have a somewhat reliable income source, in the face of demonetization or long stretches without uploads. Patreon does have a gap area, where creators might need to fund a project that needs some hefty upfront capital. In the board game community, there are dozens upon dozens of independent developers who need one-time funds in order to get their game to the publishing stage. The solution, of course, is Kickstarter. Kickstarter is a crowdfunding website that allows creators to publish their projects with a funding goal. If enough people donate, the goal is met, the project is funded, and Kickstarter takes roughly a 10% cut for themselves and transaction fees. There have been tens of thousands of projects posted to Kickstarter, all of which have foregone more traditional methods of funding in favor of appealing to the goodness in people's hearts. By using Kickstarter, projects that have artistic merit but are commercially questionable can still exist. Of course, these projects aren't always artistic in nature. There are a number of Kickstarter projects that are products trying to find a market, or are trying to prove to venture capitalists that there is a market, so they get funding. While that might not have been the original intention, the core concept is still solid, and helps lift people from hefty monetary shackles on their creative freedom. However, there is a problem with these services that is inherent and unavoidable. Only projects and creators with a wide market appeal get funded. Even though there isn't a monetary barrier to create a Kickstarter or Patreon, you're not likely to get donations if you don't have a wide enough appeal to reach somebody willing to give you money. Even if there was an objective way to determine if your content is better than someone else's, if that someone else happens to have more eyes on their Patreon, they're more likely to get patrons. In addition, most people don't like to give money away for nothing. This results in content creators having to incentivize patronage by keeping content behind a paywall, with increasing rewards for more money. That's not to mention the potential changes to Patreon's payout policy. Patreon is looking to reduce their payout model in an attempt to increase their revenue. Not to mention that there's still a monetary barrier to websites like Instructables and YouTube, while the content itself is more often than not free, actually getting onto the website requires a computer or cell phone, and an internet connection. While it is a much lower monetary and time barrier than classes for all the skills you can learn, it still exists. In the end, while all these services do help to mitigate the problems caused by capitalism, they can't fully fix them. Ultimately, this struggle between capitalism and art can be summarized through the story of Anish Kapoor and Stuart Semple. Kapoor was the sculptor behind Cloudgate, commonly referred to as the Bean, which cost a total of $23 million to make. 
Supposedly, Kapoor hates that it's nicknamed Bean, but I was unable to find a reliable source on that. In more recent news, Kapoor has been earning flack from the artist community for getting exclusive rights to use Vantablack. Vantablack is a pigment so dark it absorbs 99.96% of light. By getting these exclusive rights, Kapoor has prevented any other artist from using material without facing legal consequences, if they could get their hands on it in the first place. Understandably, other artists were upset that such an amazing color, or lack thereof, would be usable by only a single person. Unfortunately, without a team of researchers willing to spend some months or years recreating this nanotube system, there's no real way to remedy the situation. Enter Stuart Semple. Semple is a member of Culture Hustle, which is a small team of young artists and paint makers based out of an art studio in Dorset, England. They have an online store offering powders, potions, and gifts. Everything they sell, they make themselves. They even sell a watercolor palette, which is sold on a not-for-profit basis. From the product page, this is not a student-grade set. These are professional quality, high-end colors comparable to the most expensive sets available. While I can't vouch for the actual quality of the watercolor, a group selling their product at cost is wonderful. By keeping the price to an absolute minimum, it allows for more people to be exposed to art. Semple himself is a British artist who's been doing art shows around the world for about 15 years. Culture Hustle took a shot at Kapoor by having the following disclaimer on one of their products. Note, by adding this product to your cart, you confirm that you are not Anish Kapoor, you are in no way affiliated to Anish Kapoor, you are not purchasing this item on behalf of Anish Kapoor or an associate of Anish Kapoor. To the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, this high-grade glitter will not make its way into the hands of Anish Kapoor. This disclaimer can be found on other products around the website. Anish Kapoor ignored this disclaimer. Kapoor posted a picture of his middle finger dipped in pinkest pink, a pigment that Culture Hustle sells, and specifically banned him from using. Kapoor revels in this controversy that he's created, either believing that he's done nothing wrong or that he's above consequences. However, Stuart Semple has been working on something. As it turns out, Culture Hustle has put their paint-making skills to use. In response to Kapoor getting sole rights to the use of Vantablack, they developed their own blackest paint. They raised funds for their third attempt at this blackest paint, simply named Black 3.0. The product is completed, usable, but they needed funds to afford the minimum production. The paint absorbs almost 99% of visible light and is a safe-to-use, water-soluble product. In addition, it looks to be a somewhat affordable price, with a small bottle of the paint being sent out to bankers who donated at least $13. As of writing, 5,844 backers have helped pledge $344,346 of the $32,651 goal. Here, we have two artists that personify the struggle between capitalism and art. One creates for the rich, and the other for everybody. One wants to consolidate, the other to share. One has art that has an estimated price between $325,000 and $456,000, and the other sells watercolor palettes at cost. The page for Black 3.0 has a quote. It should be what you take away from the video. The limits of your creations should be your imagination, not how rich or successful you are. Until we get to the point where 3 out of 10 Americans are no longer in poverty, where 800 people don't get laid off because $7 billion isn't enough, we will never reach that point. As I'm sure you've noticed, I have been placing citations throughout the video. I wanted to make sure that anyone who wanted to read more had the opportunity, as well as prove that I might have paid attention in English class once. If you have any further questions, comments, or complaints, please let me know in the comments below. Any feedback on the video would be wonderful. If you liked what you've seen, I would appreciate it if you liked and subscribed, and shared this video with your friend who won't shut up about the plight of the proletariat. My Twitter is down below. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day.